hand out. Yeah, as I said, if you stop playing with it and apply that cream like I told you and come back and see me in a week. Oh, hello. Welcome to Tweed's Garage, where in this video, I'll be updating your progress on my Riley 9 Monaco. In the last video, I discovered that the block was cracked in, uh, in many places. Um, which uh, left me a little bit crestfallen and I had to try and find a way round it, you know, what I could do about it. So I put that on the back burner for a bit and got on with other things. Um, I, um, when I first got the car, the there was an indicator, it's got indicators mounted on it and the indicator switch was just a little toggle switch mounted on the side of the um, glove box, which was okay, um, but you, you know, you'd go, you'd turn it on, and then you'd forget that your indicators are going, which wasn't wasn't ideal, really, especially today with the dippy drivers that you have today. So um, I decided to make a, a plate up. I'd made it up early earlier on and uh, fitted it, and it had a little indicator light as well, so you could check see that they are on. And and the dash on the Riley, that there's not a lot of space, spare space to tuck anything, but I managed to sort of bolt it on the side of the, the um, existing mounting bolts of the steering column. Um, so, and it just mounts just behind the dashboard uh, and it's just down, out, you know, down in the corner of your eye. Um, the only thing I didn't do um, when I uh, made it was actually sort of try and change gear. And when I took it out for a drive, I discovered that uh, it was very close uh, on first gear. You had to sort of hold the gear stick underneath and, and change gear. So that wasn't ideal. So I, because um, I had to take the steering column out, I um, bought the plate out, stripped it down, uh, cut it round so it would fit around the, uh, the gear knob and it will move the switch over and then and then smoothed it all off again and repainted it and i think that'll that'll work okay um the other things that would distract me I'll, if i can find out how to do it i'll put a link up i made a new head for the uh, fuel sender for the fuel gauge so uh, that took a few evenings engineering to sort that out so I looked into uh, laser welding and um, found a company and it was via a, word of mouth from somebody and then watching an, another chap's uh, video and he talked about the same or a company down in Portsmouth that done laser welding so I had a little search on the internet and found a company called EMP Toolings down in Havant and they do laser welding on uh, cast iron uh, well and aluminium and all sorts um, so I went down to see them and uh, saw Alan down there very nice chap it was Alan and his brother the uh, do, do the welding down there and they uh, gave me a tour of the workshop what was going on down there and uh, yeah it really did put me at ease because when you mention sort of laser welding cast iron blocks you get a lot of people say oh I've had you know friends had that done and you end up chasing cracks and all this kind of thing uh, but when I saw what engines they were doing down there and uh, what type of work and he's he's the guy apparently on the uh, Willys Jeeps uh, there's a sort of a weak point on the block and they crack on the in the block all in the same place and he, he says over the years he's done about 41 of these blocks for a, you know Willys Jeeps around the, around the country and um, and there was cylinder heads that had been stitched previously that he was sort of welding up and um, yeah and he was saying a lot of his clients are the uh, who uh, do build a lot of the cars for the the Goodwood um, revival and that kind of thing so uh, so yeah, I think he knew his stuff and it sort of filled me with confidence. And he also recommended what they do afterwards. They do the welding and then they send the blocks off to another company that sort of immerse it in a ceramic liquid or coating of some sort and then put it under a vacuum and that gets drawn into all the sort of pores in the cast iron and any sort of hairline cracks and um, helps seal it up. And he says all the all the top engine boys and that get that done you know as a matter of course so uh, you know as he said it I got it done um, just for peace of mind really so I didn't put it in and then finally got you know water leak um, creeping up you know a crack in the crack around the around the weld or something so yeah 
So that was, that was the plan, to get that done. So before sending it down for the work, I needed to, to decide what thread sizes I was going to have in the block because they grind out the crack right up to the edge of the thread and then weld right up to it. It's, it's that accurate, um, but they don't break into the thread because then it'd be really difficult because you've got a hard weld there to sort of recut the thread. You'd end up damaging your taps trying to trying to do it. So I um, ordered some studs from the Riley Club, some oversized studs, thinking that the, the holes that were helicoil, I could just take the helicoil out and then put the oversized studs in. But it doesn't work like that. I wasn't really thinking properly. Um, because what you have with a, a, a normal hole, when you go up a size, uh, the sort of the pitch of thread tends to drop down a bit. Uh, let's see if I can show you an example here. Let's get you on the camera. Let's have a look. Don't know if you can see. So we've got 18 inch there, 40 pitch, and then we go to sort of next one up three sixteenths and it goes to a twenty-four. You know, and each time it goes up a size, it gradually the, the, the pitch gets uh, slightly larger. Yeah, so but what a helicoil does is it mirrors the pitch of the original thread. So the hole gets bigger but the pitch stays the same. So what I had to do then was get some custom made studs with a helicoil, mirroring a helicoil thread on it for the holes that were already there. And then I decided, because the threads were damaged, you know, they were corroded away and quite poor, I decided to drill all the, all the stud holes out and re-tap them up to the helicoil size. So then once that was done, it was time to get the, uh, get the block down. And it was all hands to the, to the wheel. Um, and I got my uh, blonde bird to uh, assist me in fitting the last couple of tyres to the rear wheels and, uh, and then got them bolted on and that allowed me to uh, roll the car out of the garage and lower the uh, engine block down to the ground and then I could start stripping it down because for welding the block needed to be uh, a bare block. So once it was on the ground I stripped the uh, clutch off the back of the block uh, that all seemed in good order, apart from there's a bearing at the end of the output shaft of the clutch uh, and it goes into the, the, the back of the um, flywheel. Um, that was, they go dry because they're, where they are you can't get in to lubricate them and uh, although it seemed okay when you turned it, it was, it was like it had swollen, it was really, really tight, it wasn't, wasn't sort of, uh, wasn't brunelled, but yeah, anyway. so. Got a new one of them um, ordered and then uh, carried on stripping the engine. Uh, as I've done a little video of the flywheel, that, that was really tight, that took some getting off. But that's a good thing because sometimes um, they've gone loose on the tapers and the tapers get damaged on the back of the crank. Uh, so yeah, that was a good sign. It was done up really tight. In fact, everything was done up really tight on the engine. Yeah, uh, the camshaft gear nuts, they were both really, really tight. I couldn't get them undone and because it's got a, a fibre washer, an intermediate fibre washer in the middle, I didn't want to put any strain on it and end up breaking that. So I left them on, um, but you can get the cams out by undoing the carrier securing nut, the bearing carrier securing nut, and then drawing the whole lot out. But I had to make a grind up a little spanner to get, get in there to get them undone. Um, so, got them out, uh, we've drew the uh, cam followers and the um, lag tappets and uh, put them in a, all in order in a block of wood so I didn't get them mixed up. And then um, we've drew the uh, crankshaft and again I couldn't get the, the, the end now off the end of the crankshaft so I undone the whole um, crank carrier on the front, the aluminium housing, the back of the timing chest and just pulled the whole lot out and uh, just worked on it like that. Um, and then, then sort of took out all the uh, uh, oil pipes and the oil pressure switch and, uh, and the oil pump. So with the engine stripped off 
and uh, cleaned up. I uh, took that off down to Haven and uh, handed it over to uh, Alan and his brother to uh, work on for me and uh, then carried on doing other little jobs at home. Uh, that's why it's taken so long because you know you work on something for, you know, evenings at an end and weekends and that you get to a point you get a little bit fed up with it so I tend to sort of flit like a butterfly from project to project so the, the, this this turned up this was a non-runner um, so I was fiddling around with that and then uh, there was a nice little Suzuki moped that turned up for sale and uh, yeah it's just so cute just had to have it so um, I was fiddling around with that for a while um, so I got on with cleaning out all the oil pipes and the oil pump and um, remove the uh, sludge trap bolts out the crankshaft and uh, cleaned them all out, blew them all out and washed them through. But actually they were pretty good. I was expecting to find a lot of crud in there. So then moved on to the engine components. Uh, I've got new small end bearings. As I was putting new pistons and gudging pins in, I thought it was best to put new small end bearings in. Uh, I've got four new ones from the club. And I made up a little uh, little tool, little, uh, a little rest to rest the uh, uh, comrades on, so not to damage them. And then a little pressing pin to press them out with a, an adapter that went on that to then, then be able to press the new ones in. And that worked really well until I got to the second one and uh, went to place the uh, small end bush in the end of the rod and it just fell straight through. So. Um, realized there was a bit of a problem there the other two were okay so i've done the other two and then i measured up and obviously i don't know whether the, the uh, small end bearing at some time had spun round so it was about a thou oversized so whether it had been rebored and then a, a slightly bigger um, small end bush put in so at one time you could used to get oversized valve guides and oversized small end bearings um, but you know they don't they don't do that now. So I had to um, turn to the trusty lathe and uh, turn turn a new one up. So turned a new bush up, and unfortunately it didn't come with an oil hole. But that was an advantage really because all the other rods, what I had to do was um, blew them all up and then scribe lines to the edge of the rod where that where the hole each outer edge of the hole was and then on the bush as well scribe two two lines where the outside of the hole was so then when I put it in my little tool to press it press it together I could line line the lines up and then push it in and get it as as much in the center as I could and that that works okay because I think the hole in the bushes was slightly smaller than the hole in the rod so once they were all uh, pushed in so heated the rods up pushed the small end bushes in drilled the holes to the, uh, the correct size corresponding on the rod and uh, deburred them and then uh, reamed them all to size. So, uh, and that was them all sorted. So with the rods done, I then uh, balanced the rods and balanced the pistons all to the, uh, so they're all the same weight um, and then uh, put them to one side and then uh, they were ready for when the block came back.
So another job that needed doing was the uh, eccentric straps on the oil pump were worn at the ends where they operate the uh, oil pump pistons. They'd gone slightly oval, so I uh, put them on the mill, uh, ascertained where the original centre of the hole was, then bored them out slightly oversized, made, turned some uh, little bushings up to go in, and then silver soldered them in, cleaned them up on the mill, and then re-drilled them. So reamed them to size and then tried them and that seems to have improved uh, that problem no end. So then all we had to do was wait for the uh, block to come back. So when the uh, block came back, um, yeah, really nice job on the top. Um, uh, but then I had to, uh, another problem I had to sort out was the bores. They weren't too bad, um, a little bit rigid at the top and a couple of sort of rust marks where over the years where it had been standing, you know, the old cars get leaves standing for a long time in their lives, you never know what happens to them. So there's a couple of sort of rust rings, not, not really bad, but sort of needed to try and get rid of. Uh, the ridging wasn't too bad at the top. The other thing was, when I first got it, I saw it was almost like it was hydraulicking. When, first time you tried to start it, it sort of really sort of sluggish to, to sort of spin up and then the second time it was fine and I uh, didn't think anything of it um, but when I actually took the engine apart found that number three cylinder had obviously sort of seized up at some time and um, it was getting better <laughs> when I was driving it it was obviously getting better it was wearing itself back in again but there was some uh, aluminium pickup on the on the bores but no scoring on the bores so uh, with a hand scraper I uh, managed to scrape off uh, the old bits of aluminium and then I honed all four, four bores uh, to clean them back up again and then, uh, and then got on and painted the block so it looked nice, so it's all nice and, uh, nice and shiny um, and then uh, start assembling it. Cool, isn't it hot? It is hot, isn't it? Yeah, I think this might be a two-parter. It's just that you're Italian and unreliable, aren't you? Yeah. Oh! When it... F when it used to...